Hello and welcome to Varmablog. And today I'm here with the two of the three founders of the Platypus Affiliated Society. Um, we're talking about the origins of Platypus as well as its implications. This conversation kind of comes out of a re engagement that I've had with the uh, Platypus Affiliated Society in the last two years, but also a uh, show where I was kind of unexpectedly asked to talk about platypus on a Colin show by Ben Burgess, uh, who um, I don't think he minds me saying that he's not a fan. Um, and I repeated some things that were not entirely true, um, that they were kind of rumors in my far, 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 far satellite uh, chapter of Platypus many years ago. So with that, I wanted to turn it over to Chris and Spencer to talk about where the where the platypus come from i've you know i've read the initial doctrine uh doctrine i read the initial document um on the website when i joined about its relationship to the anti-war movement um about its relationship to trotskyism but i was unclear on the specifics well that document of course came at the request of spencer and also our other friend sunit singh who were attending the SWP UK's Marxism conference in the mm -hmm. summer of 2006. And uh, the reading group had already started um, several months earlier than that, um, based on our students from uh, the University of Chicago and the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, and then, uh, yeah, they sort of said, well, we need something to intervene with. And so, um, you know, consulting with them and with uh, Richard Rubin and also with some of the um, platypus, the early reading group participants, my students, um, I drafted that uh, what is a platypus in the short history of the left. First, it was what it was, what is a platypus? And then they said, well, this needs some explanation. So then it was the short history of the left. And the statement of purpose of the uh, organization was drafted the following year. Uh, by um, Marco Torres and uh, Pam Nogales and Lori Rojas, who I think you so, met. That. Yeah, I met Pam Nogales and Lori Rojas, I believe. I don't, I have interacted with Marco Torres. I don't know if I've met him in person. Right. One of the things that Chris is kind of glossing over there is that, you know, he's really the founder of Platypus. I wasn't around. Um, we, sometimes refer to to chris and richard and myself as sort of the gen zero of platypus right mm -hmm. i wasn't part of the first generation of platypus i wasn't there i was in far-flung places like london um at some point i'll unearth i've never done it before chris but um you know unearth all of the emails that we used to exchange right uh, you know, Chris and I had a long friendship before uh, Platypus was founded, and you know there were there were people in our circle like Sunit that Chris referred to. So I was, and I don't know what I was educating Sunit in. You know, when I think about it, like taking I took him to the SWP conference. Right, he was reading um, Marx and Hegel. I remember bringing Chris to to help. Uh, to you know, they wanted to talk about Hegel, and I said, well, "I've got this friend Chris. Uh, you should talk to." So Sunit and I were friends. He was friends with Chris, uh, but the the founding of Platypus was really, you know, it was undertaken by Chris together with the students that recruited him to teach them Marxism. Um, it it kind of had roots and discussions that he and I had had, uh, but anyway, what I'm what I was trying to say is that you know, I was in far flung places, and I would get these reports from Chris, right? These long emails, and you know, back then I had to go to like internet cafes, 
in India, and I would read these like long discussions about the formation of platypus, and you know, I guess uh, give some kind of feedback or 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 whatever sound serve as a sounding board. Uh, I I really sort of returned to Chicago, and in that sense, to platypus. Um, around the time of the election of Obama. Hmm. Right. Now the, um, so, you know, Spencer and I were talking about what we might discuss with you, Derek, because um, I guess uh, this is in the wake of you feeling like you misrepresented platypus on a, on a podcast. And so we were thinking, okay, well, what's the backstory that, um, that you may not be aware of, but that, uh, people have a sense of in some way, you know, uh, Spencer and my friendship as graduate students at the University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about the University of Chicago and has how it has a reputation. It has like two different right wing reputations. It has the reputation of the Chicago School of like economics, right? The kind of neoliberal economics. Um, but it also has the reputation of a kind of neoconservative uh, especially cultural conservative, like Alan Bloom, closing of the American mind kind of thing. Mm -hmm. the Committee on Social Thought and the Leo Straussians. Right. And, you know, I was warned by Adolf Reed when I, uh, you know, was in Chicago and we met up. He's like, you got to watch out for those motherfucking Straussians. They're <laughs> everywhere. They're everywhere you look, right? You'll be, he said, he's like, you know, I'll be talking to a woman at a bar you know, and thinking I might get lucky. And then it turns out she's a fucking Straussian. So um, <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, we did not have that experience, right? We didn't, uh, that was not our experience. Our experience was much more standard academic culture um, in terms of it being very liberal, very PC, very democratic party. And um, the the conservatives were safely sequestered in these other places that no one ever went to. Um, you know, there was some point of contact with the Committee on Social Thought, but its heroic days were behind it. And the Committee on Social Thought was no longer Straussian. It was being run by Robert Pippin, um, who brought a very different kind of energy to it. And, um, and really, the University of Chicago experience that Spencer and I had that was formative um, that was as much the basis of our friendship as anything was teaching in the college, the college core curriculum. So that's sort of, you know, I guess people would call it the great books kind of approach to, um, you know, kind of primary literature education for undergraduates. And, um, you know, Spencer. Chris has, has gotten frozen. Uh, I'll, I'll pick up until he gets back on. Um, you know, he and I were in classes together uh, with with Moish Pastone uh, primarily, but you know, we really, uh, I you know, I think it, you know, our friendship has been intellectual and me intellectually mediated, of course, from the beginning. You know, and the the discussions that I really remember with Chris at the dawn of our friendship were things like Durkheim. Mm -hmm right where we were teaching it together and just sort of conceiving you know of, you know and of course things like adam smith um and we were teaching together interestingly we ended up teaching together under moish postone's supervision but initially it was actually a different sequence um it was power identity resistance and it was uh liberalism and its critics and so we were teaching other things that Moish actually doesn't teach, like Nietzsche, right? Mm -hmm. which I hadn't taken Nietzsche seriously since I was in high school when my friends were really into Zarathustra. And I was like, yeah, what is this bullshit? Um, but then I found like a new appreciation of, of Nietzsche, um, you know, much later. Um, I was aware that he was in the background of the Frankfurt School, but really um, Spencer had an appreciation for Nietzsche going back that um but teaching it you know like you don't i i feel you don't really know something until you teach it mm -hmm. and so you know a very different education you know i had read adam smith in college but it left no impact on me and i was taught it in a kind of typical kind of left kind of marxist kind of way um mm -hmm. you know to take it seriously but to sort of again sort of coordinate off in a particular way 
So when you're teaching this stuff directly to undergraduates, it's a very different thing. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, Spencer and I had the shared experience of taking Moish Pistone's class. We met in his famed capital course, but then we took other courses on the Frankfurt School and on more contemporary leftist critiques of neoliberal capitalism. You know, we read like David Harvey together and, and people like that. But really, I think we bonded over the teaching um, in a profound way um, because we were we were very much interested in teaching this material honestly, you know, and, and really freeing it from all the accumulated baggage um, and not not teaching it in a tendentiously leftist way. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, but really being open to it in a way that, you know, our colleagues were just not, they're just, we're not open to these things anymore. You know, these thinkers from the 18th and 19th centuries, they were not, or the early 20th century. Um, and, and we had to struggle yeah. a lot with Moish. Oh yeah. To <laughs> do that. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, because, um, you know, I don't know what it was that I, I he had, he had, closed these books for himself in a certain way and obviously that was the case you know through his reading of Marx there were certain you know I think tendentious things that that flowed from that uh, for instance we had to really fight to teach Rousseau and and to teach a certain oh yeah and, and to teach Adam Smith in an honest way uh you know or what we viewed as an honest way um you know, but no, this stuff is forbidden from the 20th century. I mean, Moish was, uh, he was himself a product of the University of Chicago undergraduate education, as well as graduate education. And so he had himself experienced this education that we were trying to give to undergraduate students now. And he had very typical new left kind of biases about all these things. I mean, it's very ironical uh, that Moish had a kind of anti-traditional Marxism you know, kind of framework, but then mm -hmm. his perspective was actually in many respects quite traditionally Marxist when it came to bourgeois society and bourgeois thinkers. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, like what Spencer said, these were kind of closed books. Um, you know, he, he'd acknowledge things sometimes, but mostly under our pressure for him to do so. Um, you know, we also taught Freud together, you know, so Freud I had been familiar with, but again, had not really delved mm -hmm. into until I had to teach it. And we had the benefit of, um, a guy, Bert Kohler, who was himself a psychoanalyst, um, who was an older, older generation faculty. And he might've even been Moish's teacher at some point. Was that right, Spencer? There's some like, deep I can't say. I because can't say about that for he sure. He was almost a full generation older than Moish, which was mm -hmm. remarkable. Right. Um, Moish would defer to him, and and therefore the conversation about Freud had a kind of different dynamic. Moish otherwise led. You know, the other, what was also happening, Derek, is that of course we were, you know, pursuing dissertations, mm -hmm. and you know, Chris was, you know, looking at in effect the intellectual aftermath of Marxism via the Frankfurt School uh, and Adorno. And I was looking at the intellectual aftermath of the 20th century from the point of view of like what it had done to early modern history. Um, you know, and so we were both kind of leveraging the, the attitude that we were, you know, and the energy that we were drawing from teaching a kind of you know powerful impulse to revisit the past and you know the texts that were sort of covered with the detritus of the 20th century sweeping that off these texts and trying to read them again yeah i hadn't uh, thought about that that it's almost like bookends because you were working on um you know uh i guess you'd call it early colonial india you know, in the 1700s, and I was dealing with the Frankfurt School with Adorno, who's like the youngest member of the Frankfurt School, the first generation, and so it really was bookends on it, um, you know, on this kind of historical period. Um, but I think that, um, you know, the revelation for us... And Marx was very much a nexus 
Oh yeah, right. both Connected. for like accessing the history of bourgeois, the rise of bourgeois society. So I drew very heavily from Marx to try to reopen uh, the history of the 18th century, and of course, uh, Chris was drawing on Marx and Marxism in his reading of Adorno. Sorry, Chris, go ahead. No, that's okay. Um, you know, because I do think that uh, part of our kind of reputation, if you will, in Platypus is this kind of liberalism and socialism thing. <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, a kind of, you know, bourgeois social basis for the struggle for socialism. And, you know, which again would not have been uh, remarkable or certainly news to anyone in an earlier generation of, of Marxism in a much earlier generation of Marxism. So a hundred years ago or more than a hundred years ago, none of the things that we were trying to raise about the relationship between bourgeois society and the struggle for socialism would have been controversial to anybody, to Rosa Luxemburg, Lenin, Trotsky, Kautsky, none of them would have, you know, Stalin and Mao wouldn't dispute the points that we're making. Right. Um, and so it's only very recently, it's only after the new left and really after the collapse of the new left, because the new left itself also maintained this consciousness. After the collapse of the new left, then the left became very anti-bourgeois in a particular way. It's really a kind of a postmodernist thing that then, uh, I mean, it, ironically, even though postmodernism is like a kind of anti-Stalinism, mm -hmm. French fries are, are kind of chafing under the uh, weight of the French Communist Party, but actually postmodernism assumes a lot of Stalinist perspectives. Like it's... A... Yeah, you, you know, the, the um, attempt to, you know, I don't, you know, it was either you had a critique of the Enlightenment, right? This was the kind of language that people would talk in in the 1990s, uh, in intellectual circles that was, of course, permeating the left. Uh, I think on the left, a lot of it was authorized by sort of Althusser's critique of humanism. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the idea that, that, that Marx and Marxism were like something else, right? That they were not you know, imminent to the Enlightenment or imminent to bourgeois society, but, uh, you know, it was a standpoint epistemology. It was the point of view of the press. You got, you know, these weird things like Badu, right? A kind of eternal critique, communist critique of the, from the point of view of the downtrodden, mm -hmm. um, you know, this sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, you know, uh, at this point, you know, sometimes it feels like the wreckage and the miseducation of young people is just so vast because they're the prof you know, the people in our generation, Derek, were educated in this secondhand way. They had no idea what motivated the ideas that they were being taught. Right. Oh yeah. I, I definitely experienced that when I was in grad school. Like, like we were like, we'd be handed uh, Baudrillard, you know, post uh, simulation of simulacra, and we would be given no context of like his relationship to the French Communist Party, or or his fallout with that, or what all the, you know, we were taught it actually, and in this Deleuzian way. That's like the worst kind of pragmatism, like the idea that like any concept is just free floating and you can grab it and use it completely removed and reappropriated. And that's how we were taught these things. Um, and uh, at, at, for, for me, it was a conservatizing experience. I left I left uh, undergrad as like a militant paleoconservative <laughs> like, reaction. Again. Yeah. Yeah, totally in reaction against that because I was just like, "That's all nonsense. Like, it's not useful. I don't see what it's doing." Um, you know how that happened, by the way, because I feel like I was in some kind of strange laboratory for this at Hampshire College. Okay, because um, you know I was taught by Marxists, like kind of Marxist new leftists, like people who thought of themselves as like really Marxist mm -hmm. and who were not postmodernist. 
but who were deeply demoralized in the were 80s. Really coming out of the 60s and 70s. I mean, it was still sort of fresh. The trauma was still fresh for them. And they were like, you know, I mean, I think that I talk about it in my paths to Marxism. Margaret Cirillo, who was the editor of Radical America, that was the legacy journal from the Students for a Democratic Society. You know, she like, you know, she was like, yeah, you know, she's a lesbian. And, you know, she's like, yeah, you know, I'm a Marxist, but I feel like I'm a dinosaur. And, you know, kids are into Foucault now. And so maybe we should take Foucault seriously, even though Foucault said that rape shouldn't be treated as a crime. Right. She had this kind of feminist thing about Foucault. And but she sort of capitulated. Right. She's just like, well, what, what are we going to do? Right. So the grab bag approach to ideas um, really had to do with losing the plot. I mean, they had very much lost the plot politically and it was very hard for them to maintain it intellectually. So. I am personally in an odd generational chasm and that like I somehow I have one foot in the Gen X left, whatever the fuck that is, and another foot in the millennial left, whatever the fuck that is. Generation and, Y, isn't it? Yeah. As yeah. In the, the, W-H-Y. Yeah. Yeah. Y that exact, <laughs> yeah. That exact generation. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like I kind of went through this this period of which Foucault was super dominant in universities, even in, I was in a fairly conservative university. We still had like Foucault shoved down our throats. Um, I like the, the, the idea that I would have met Marxists in college who weren't it, idiot undergrads uh, was like, not that would, that wouldn't even even occurred to me. Um, and so we had that. And then as I was finishing up grad school um, and applying for jobs, Badu, Zizek, um, uh, to a lesser degree, Lacroix and, and Muth. Uh, they were there know, already. Yeah, they were there already, as was Hart and Nagiri. I mean, as I kind of remind people, Hart and Nagiri was a bestseller when I was 19. We years read old. it with Moish, believe it or not. Whoa. Yeah, we read it with Moish because we were reading a course uh, that he taught was called The Present as History. Mm -hmm. and it was basically trying to deal with the post-Soviet world and or the neoliberal world. So we read David Harvey, Condition mm -hmm. of Modernity, but we also read Hart and Negri, Empire. We didn't do Multitude and Commonwealth. We just did Empire. Um, and, uh, you know, Moish would always say, because, you know, he would he would, in a sense, give people license to dismiss a lot of the stuff with his own ideas. But then in teaching a course like that, he said, well, we're not going to we're not going to wrap it up and throw it in the bin. Let's take it seriously. All right. So it's oh, yeah. the impulse of his own students who would be like, oh, well, there's no commodity form analysis. So it's just whatever fetish forms. Mm -hmm. And he would say, oh, no, but this is the way capitalism really appears now. Right. So Hart and Negri, I mean. Yeah, you know, we can kind of make fun of it now. Um, but, you know, it did capture the zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. no, I mean, Michael not. Hart, who wrote the introduction to uh, the Verso publication of Thomas Jefferson. Whatever it's happened true. to that? Right? Yeah. In other words, Thomas Jefferson Revolutionary by Michael Hart. Mm -hmm. Okay, then. That's in the rear view. Yeah, and so then there was this return to Mark. Eric, which... you're talking about what, like 2000? Yeah. Oh, for me, for me, it's actually so I was in I was in Georgia in a conservative school, so it's probably gonna be about four years later. So for this is 2000 to 2005 for me. Yeah. yeah. So um, and it's like kind this of concurrent. Is, is absolutely. The years in which Chris and I were. Became friends. Yeah. 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 yeah and I'm about uh, a decade younger than you guys. So mm -hmm. um, right. and. I was going through that at the time. I, I got pulled into the paleo conservative world. I've talked about this a lot. Even sound the stupid Ustin Manifesto as a Ustin as Manifesto. a Manifesto. Is that paleocon? It no, it was a weird, it was a weird mixture of people. It was like that's like liberal, like centrist. Liberals. Liberal. Um there were some Sam's dot libertarians, and then some of us uh some paleocons signed it off of the idea that we would be because we were anti-war but we didn't want to endorse shit like uh 
you know, Bathism. Hugo Chavez at Bathism in Iran. Like all that was like very was different. Like, very right. different. Right. <laughs> so all three of those very different things. Hey. Right. Uh, um, Bolivarian revolution, Bathism, Arab nationalism, quasi-fascist Arab nationalism, and then Islam, Islamic revolution. Very different things. Uh, exactly. Um, well, what was paleoconservatism for you? For me, it was uh, Pat Buchanan, er, uh, late period reform. I mean, like party. literally. Yeah. Like anti-war. Trump, Trump quit the reform party because he didn't like Pat Buchanan because he was too right wing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I came into that after the Trump, the Trump Buchanan war. Why? Like, Jesse Ventura too. Yeah. Right? Him and Trump left because they couldn't stand Pat Buchanan's right wing shit. And specifically what got me into that was antiwar.com and uh, because I was involved in the anti-war movement and that's actually kind of how I got to you guys 10 years later. Um, and my experience of the anti-war movement was that like international answer was profoundly unserious and or, or quite serious, but just bad. <laughs> right. Depending on where you were at. Um, right. But like was dude still running around. Um, who's the guy who's like an ex U S government official, Ramsey Clark. Yeah, he was in red. Ramsey Clark was still running around. What's his background, Spencer? He's like, uh, Nixon era. What is his deal? Ramsey Clark. I forget, but he, what he, he started speaking at like RCP events or something. Uh, okay. no, he's also, what do you call it? Answer. He's also workers world. He's like kind of standard fare, like anti-war kind of anti-military industrial complex kind of guy. You know, he's like the lib. He's like I would have, I would have known 20 years ago. I've, I've forgotten. What we I'm... went by the way. So before platypus, of course we went to the anti-war demos. Mm -hmm. you know, we were there from the beginning. And, um, of course we were against the war. Um, you know, very much so. So Pat Buchanan was against the war. Right. Yeah, okay. But yeah, I was kind of unaware. War. Pat Buchanan, like, kind of didn't register for me. Like, he was either, I had the sort of typical silly leftist kind of whatever, like Christian fascism. Mm -hmm. You know, like, in other words, he was either like a Reaganite or he was some kind of Christian fascist. And so I just had no real sense of him, like, whatsoever. You know, um, and so again, paleocon is a kind of a funny thing. So it's kind of anti neocon, mm -hmm. right? But it can be Reaganite. Yeah, sometimes, yes, yeah. Right? It... Even though Reaganism is like neocon, neolib, Christian evangelical in a way that I don't know. Maybe the paleocons are, maybe there aren't. Yeah, the the paleocons have their their Catholic branch. They're they're really weirdo Jewish branch around Paul Gottfried, which is kind of what I was more attracted to. And um, their their Protestant, you know, kind of know nothing um, branch. I don't or know how cultural, it's a... cultural conservative, right? Like Americana or what? Like... Yeah, I mean, it's cultural conservative Americana. Although who, the person who got me into it, to be completely honest, was a professor of mine who was a Hegel scholar. He was a very conservative Hegel scholar. Um, Spirit and he... of America, the guy. Yeah. So, America, I mean, there's there's a there's a plausible case to be made for it, right? Um, and he was speaking to me because I kind of came out of you know um, relatively undereducated working class background and ran into like a lot of like Chomsky quoters and the punk scene was initially attracted by that, but then during the anti war years, uh, you know international answer particularly in this i mean we are in the south we're not you know so it's a little bit different but was just so rcp was world can't wait yeah <laughs> world can't wait world can't wait for bush to be out of office right i mean and like you know bush is a fascist um preparing fascism for three thousand years yeah like they I would mean... they would have their amazing sound system <laughs> and it would be like monster truck rally type voice that's gonna <laughs> boom out they're trying yep. to establish not the thousand year rank but the three thousand year rank and, and buchanan had done this weird thing like i my one venture into leftism as a teenager was going all the way out driving my happy ass all the way out to the to the um battle for seattle before it was called that uh out to yep. protest it uh out to protest the um the g8 
back mm-hmm. then. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, it, it had left, you know, we just come as zine kids. We had saved up a, there were conservatives at the Seattle protest. There were, and that's what I was like. Like the first, the first crack of that idea was actually Pat Buchanan was there. Yeah, and yeah. so he wrote this book, A Republic, Not an Empire. I got a hold of it. It seemed plausible. Um, I was studying a lot of Hegel, Nietzsche, um, and and kind of, you know, Marx was read with real kids' gloves where I was at. Like it was like, oh, we're going to talk about the manifesto, and isn't that cute? Um, now go read uh, Baudrillard and and Derrida. Yeah, um, that's what it was. It, it was kind of like that for me in college. I think that Spencer had a better, in some ways, undergraduate education and more kind of expansive view of things. Um, Hampshire was definitely a little bit of a hothouse environment, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, Spencer, you got sort of inoculated against things with Richard Wordy, and right, right. I mean, I went to you know, I guess a conservative institution, which the University of Virginia, mm-hmm. which I'm pretty grateful for. You know, I, I wasn't really encountering, you know, leftism um, and was able to have a fairly intellectually sort of rich you know, education and just lots and lots of science and you know I, I think i took like six years of college courses and four and mm-hmm. and you know I, I experienced the 90s you know I, I i don't know you know where your sort of gen y experience sits here but i experienced my generation as like allowing for like a long education you know like like patience to think things through in college yeah in college yeah, and yeah. In school right i mean you know we i had it in undergrad but it was over by the time i was in grad school like i literally went through that transition like yeah like, you, know, so, for, you know when chris and i met like there wasn't like any exact like urgency to like I don't know what join something or determine the line or we were dealing with the ideas at a pretty high esoteric level without really, you know, worrying about, um, you know, what the implications were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, We had time to think about it. We had time to think about it. And, you know, there would be, you know, and and our professors were not like I mean someone like Moish Pastone was I think really thrown by nine eleven uh, and the war on terror, you know. Mm-hmm. And I remember you know people you know his close friend Andrew Arado was very thrown by it, and you know I remember the liberals, you know I remember reading like Paul Berman, Paul Berman, yeah. You know, going and reading like the Muslim Brotherhood, and you know. that's how Doug Henwood turned against us because uh, we invited him to speak on a panel with Paul Berman, hmm. and Doug Henwood decided that like he couldn't be on a panel with all white people, and um, but of course there was a, a black man from the RCP on the panel, and there was a um, I think Indian American. Um, N plus one author who I'm forgetting now. Oh, I was actually M platypus when that happened. Nick yeah. <laughs> was was it? It? yeah, it was. Yeah. And um, so What's, I don't remember Nick Hill's last name. I don't remember his last name either. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but uh, you know, but somehow he just saw Paul Berman and he's like, it platypus is all white guys. And even though all the people he was dealing with in New York were women, and many of them women of color, um they became, as he called them in a indelible phrase, Chris Catrone's hordes of secretaries. <laughs> oh, yeah. Of course, these people are just as racist and sexist as they accuse others. Mm. Yep. But I remember, like, you know, discussing, like, you know, there was, like, what was it, the UN development report on the Middle East? Mm hmm. You know, Moish was shocked at like the rates of unemployment about the poverty. Yeah, in poverty the t- and unemployment in the Middle East, and like really, like you know, and 
and like making like very elemental liberal points to his classroom like well you know this was an attack on civil society and like the state's supposed to protect you from that like, it's the most you know he would he was like rediscovering um i don't know what a liberalism that he couldn't assimilate mm. um and no, I mean he was sort of thrown in. One of the one of the early experiences that Spencer and I had was seeing Christopher Hitchens speak at the University of Chicago. And at the University of Chicago, uh, you know, Hitchens was whatever. And um, you know, we were in the audience. He was in full froth. He was in full froth for sure. And but Moish was on the stage with with Hitchens, right? And yeah. we're in the audience, and then the ISO came and denounced Hitchens from the audience. The International Socialist Organization. They were want to do that, yes. I mean, I, I, I expected that behavior from like the Spartacists. I wasn't sure about the ISO, right? And then mm -hmm. afterwards, you know, and Hitchens kind of gave a bullshit response to them, mm -hmm. I thought. And afterwards, I said to Moish, you know, like Hitchens was horrible and he made the ISO look good. And Moish was like, oh no, no one can make them look good. You know, <laughs> they're so bad. You know, for all of Hitchens' problems, he, you know, he can't make them look good because they're so bad. And I was like, yeah, get real, Moish. You know, <laughs> so, I mean, Moish, it's a funny, it's a funny thing because I think that he gets thrown in with a kind of like Zionism and therefore a kind of neoconism, something like that. And, um, you know, he just wasn't that. He, he, he belongs to... He gets blamed for the anti-Dutch, right? In some ways. He is appropriated by the anti-Deutsch for sure, but he does not like them, right? So there are two, right. two tendencies in Germany that Moish is assimilated to that he does not like. Wertkritik and the anti-Deutsch. And they don't like him either. The Wertkritik people don't like Moish either mm. um, because they think he's an idealist and not a materialist. So it's a kind of a fascinating thing when you dig deep. There's actually a great deal of hostility there. And um, so, you know, he's a kind of a sui generis kind of character, both in terms of Marxology, but really politically. Um, but but then he would be sort of pigeonholed. Um, a good and, representation of the Moish that we that we're talking about of that period, who you know, I was his research assistant and there were like fairly advanced disagreements at that point. Um, mm -hmm. But also you know a lot of exchange of like you know a lot of intellectual exchange is in a paper he wrote called history and helplessness from 2006 which kind of grew out of his thinking around this time that chris and i were referring to it's the first thing i had the kids in platypus before it was platypus like the extracurricular reading group you know, mm -hmm. when, when they approached me to establish the extracurricular re reading group, I sent them History and Helplessness. And I think that it was in manuscript form and hadn't come out yet mm -hmm. at that time. And, um, you know, we had our differences with that article, but generally agreed with the basic point. Right. Um, you know, we might have disputed. Uh, he kind of throws Fanon under the bus a little bit, doesn't he? Is that right? And uh, I think so, yeah. adopts Hannah Arendt's critique of Fanon, which is a little bit off. Yeah, ten yeah. inches. Right. Um, and so, but basically, you know, his his point regarding like, you know, you can't you can't draw a line between the new left and Al Qaeda, right? As mm -hmm. like resistance. Um, and, you know, the new left would never have done, for all of their terrorism, they would never have done this kind of terrorism. It's a totally different beast, you know. Um, and, you know, his invoking what I was familiar with from the 80s left, um, which is uh, the ANC, you know, South Africa, and also the Central American struggles, from the 80s, you know, when he was like, look, the Sandinistas in the FMLN, the ANC in the South African Communist Party, and not even Fanon's, like, inspired group, the African Consciousness Movement, you know, Steve Biko, none of these people would, would do what Al-Qaeda does, right? And so you can't, like, say, oh, well, the state always calls resistance terrorism and just leave it at that, 
right? Which is kind of the Tarek Ali kind of weaseling out, right? I think that we saw Tarek Ali also, didn't we? He came around. I mean, uh, and then and then I interviewed him early on in Platypus, but he came around, I feel like, before that. So we saw Hitchens and Ali, not at the same time, but they were they were around. And so this whole crack up of the new left over 9-11 was very present to our mind. You know, I don't know how much it it was a formative experience in a sense, but I feel like it was already a kind of just an exemplar of something. In other words, mm -hmm. I think that we already had like our outlook and then the sort of bad leftism, if you will, was just an example. It wasn't like we defined ourselves with respect to it. We were sort of a little bit horrified at how bad the left did become in that context. In other words, we sort of, you know, were girded against like the bad left, but then I think we were still shocked also. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, Chris and I sometimes would, you know, I guess one way you could think about platypus in terms of like these older people mm -hmm. is members of Gen X who were overshadowed by the new left, who were in a sense recruited to, to reproduce the new left in the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, and Chris and, and, and Richard and I, you know, are sort of peeling off of that and yeah. saying like, you know, especially in the context of like the very direct intergenerational reproduction of the left that was taking place before our eyes in the anti-war movement, um, where of course the, the older generation was the boomers, was the new left and their organizations. The ISO was very Gen X. And we were basically saying, you know, you don't have to do this. Like, you know, there's a problem here. And this uh, you know, this project doesn't uh, fully cohere. And, you know, it was like very much, you know, this is where I feel like the classroom sort of pre platypus experience. I mean, we had we had the experience of of talking to young people who were prepared to entertain like a really different and I think a much more sort of high wire approach to history of recovery mm -hmm. of a, a, without a, really, a safety net without a net and a much older uh, and I would I would argue much more radical approach to like history and of course where we were now um you know confronting the accumulated catastrophe that you know the, the very idea that you had to unearth some of these like what you know in a seminar with chris or with me could seem like a very straightforward reading of adam smith or something like that and yet they knew this is not what anyone else would have learned right they they had that sense and and so it it was that idea that like look the young people might be open to like a fundamental reconsideration and that needs to be facilitated oh yeah i mean for sure yeah, i mean I think, like that's what summoned me to you know um to platypus was okay so you want to look at things differently. You're open to looking at things differently. Um, it was in the air, you know. It wasn't. It wasn't unique to our students by any means. It was. It was the early millennial generation. I think that mm -hmm. they were. You know, we went. Uh, Spencer wasn't there for that, but that same summer that I wrote those uh, documents for Platypus, um, the. The kids from the reading group and I went to the founding convention of the new SDS. Yep. Which was held at the University of Chicago. And uh, in the summer of 2006. And, you know, what all of us remember from that was when people like Carl Davidson and others who had been in the original SDS said, look, don't follow us. In other words, you know, we're here to advise you. We're here mostly to tell you don't make our mistakes. Right. And don't don't assume anything that we assumed. So, you know, they, they and Carl Davidson especially said, 
you know, for instance, our generation has an experience of racism and the struggle against racism that may not be appropriate to your generation at all. You might have a totally different world that you're trying to engage. And therefore, you know, you can't listen to us because, you know, we're stuck in the past. Mm -hmm. That was forgotten pretty quickly. In other words, um, the, the millennials like desire to approach things de novo um, really kind of vanished. And, you know, I mentioned the ISO being like a lot of Gen X kind of cadre people older, a little bit older than me and Spencer, but not much. Right. Um, so definitely not baby boomers. And, um, you know, Bhaskar Sankara, who I do feel like we have to claim some influence on Spencer because you and I were talking to him and you met him and, you know, there was a lot of correspondence going on and there's a lot of like flirtation um, going on between uh, Bhaskar and Platypus. He spoke at the ISO's uh, annual conference here in Chicago and he said, you know, we're having to reach over a generation back to the 60s. He said that to the ISOers, you know, very much saying you people are in my way. Um, and, you know, so it had fully reversed by that point. In other words, it went from we're not going to follow the 60s to we want to follow the 60s, but we have this Gen X that's getting in the way. Hmm. Right. And so it just it's an interesting it's an interesting moment with respect to that, because I think that now our generation is in the driver's seat in corporate America, in government, in in academia. Right. Um, and so, you know, and the and the baby boom generation, the new left generation are either dying or retired. Unless they're Democrats and in, in, in an office because they're like 80. So. Oh, sure. Those people. Sure. Um, but yeah, in general, I agree I with you. And, uh, no, I do. And even even so, they are like it's a funny like even those like septuagenarian, octogenarian, um, you know, they're basically puppets of their staff and their staff mm. are Gen X. You know, you look at the Biden administration. I mean, there are millennials, too, in the Biden administration, of course. Um, but I feel like there is also this sort of Anthony Blinken Gen X type of. Yeah. Well, a lot of what Chris and I did, you know, if, if I think about my own intellectual trajectory, I, the, if the three biggest influences on me were, were Richard Rorty, Jürgen Habermas, and Moish. And what they all had in common was that they were all dissidents or critics of the new left. And, you know, I, in other words, I didn't have just a, a straightforward, especially sort of postmodern doxa concept of what that intellectual inheritance looked like. Mm -hmm. um, you know, nobody or few people would have thought of, of Moish as like a major thinker of his generation when I encountered it. Right. He was a outlier. He, he was an outlier. He was a hidden treasure at the university of Chicago. He'd been denied tenure at the university of Chicago and was a kind of a refugee in another department. Um, you know, he, he, he his, friends. his friends rescued him. His yeah. friends rescued him, you know, he, but he wasn't a name to conjure with, um, you know, in a, in any, wider world um and adolf too by the way adolf was a total like marginal gadfly kind of figure when i yeah. when i was close to adolf um you know he was not i mean i feel like it's funny he's become this kind of like canonized figure now but not at all then right and, and you know of course a lot of my uh early friendship with chris was this deep dive into all that he could show me in terms of um, Trotskyism. Trotskyism. Right. right. <laughs> I guess this is one of the things where I misidentified uh, because I had said that you were an IBT and actually I think I had attributed it to Spencer actually, not you. Um, not Richard? Or Richard, somebody. Um, because when I had gone through the reading group um, uh I have been given a lot of IBT materials. Oh, um, because it's Spartacus' stuff that's posted on the IBT website. Oh, Spartacus okay. don't post it to their website. Got it's it. under a heading 
called Spartacist Materials from When They Were Still Revolutionary. <laughs> okay, that's funny. Um, uh, so when I had gone through, I, I had asked I, the the chapter head in Korea who was uh, was from your group, and they said Carrie. Yeah, Carrie, Carrie Graham, and Carrie Graham had said like, oh, you know, uh, it's, be, uh, um, it's because um, Chris and I'm pretty sure she said Chris. I think I slowly over time transferred to Spencer in my brain. Um, Me and Richard were a Spartacus Youth Club at Hampshire. Yeah, but Richard was. Uh, he likes to say he was a member only for a month. Right. And I think just because she said that organization, I, I didn't put together that she was referring to the fact that that was Spart material Spartans, and I listed yeah. it to IBT. But yeah. th that's what a lot of people throw at you is like a lot of trots. And and uh, I'm having a couple of symposiums on why Trotskyism seems to be dying. And I will probably invite some of your people or you on eventually about that. Um, but a lot of trots. Uh, really fucking hated the Spartacist League. Well, um, right. Of course, this, the Trotskyists all hate each other with a passion. Yes. And, um, you know, it's pretty intense. Now, I mean, what I'd say about this is, you know, also in the background, you know, of the war on terror was the yeah. idea that somehow the neocons were, were all Trotskyists. Yep. I got kind of told that in paleoconservative circles all the time. Yeah, it was like uh, the Trotskyists were pursuing their agenda of world revolution through the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, I guess we can't, we can't like neglect any of this because who knows what people out there think, right? Certainly the Stalinists think that Trotsky was a fascist I've, wrecker. Right? I have heard conspiracies about Trotskyism and the Frankfurt School from from Marxist Leninists now that yeah, I used to hear CIA, from Haley. yeah, neocon something or other, right? And uh, or Cold War liberals or Cold War conservatives and Max Shackman and this and that. And you know, it's just it's 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 funny because you know the world doesn't actually make that much sense. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I think that so I remember and Spencer I think remembers it somewhat differently, but I remember having like really passionate arguments with Spencer over Trotskyism where Spencer... oh, I, was, I, I was, you know, somewhere between Stalinism and anarchism. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I had, I had been to, you know, world social forum, you know, I'd been to, I'd been, to I went one. to some of that stuff too. I, I went to the yeah. one in, in, <laughs> in Mumbai, you know, I had fully, you know, I'd read Chomsky, of course, uh, you know, but really, what Marxism was to me was some kind of Maoism, and I felt the attraction of that. Uh, and and I was getting that very strongly from my education in India and in Naxalism, Indian, Naxalism in Indian history, right? And mm -hmm. you know, I rem, you know, one of the one of the formative experiences that we used to be able to have, right, is that you could see like the history of the world as curated from different sectarian perspectives. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So there would be like an ISO. And I was also recruited to the ISO, which was. I was going to say, didn't you smoke some weed with the ISO? Or I, so few times? Yeah. They tried to get me to take bong hits in like silkscreen shirts with them in Wicker Park in Chicago. And I was like, I don't need Marxism to take, you know, to smoke pot. Um, <laughs> That's where we came up with our phrase bong hit Marxism, right? <laughs> oh, it was very weird, Derek. They were like listening to like CDs of like the the soviet army band you know playing the the international i mean it was just awful uh in some loft in 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 wicker park they used to dangle like the prettiest girls in the organization in front of young men right they would like put them out on the street corner to sell the newspaper and then they'd call you up and say like oh i met you earlier i i met you last week on the street corner uh, would you like to have a cup of coffee with this no? This one you lived in Bucktown, huh? Yeah, you know they wouldn't mention like Marxism or the ISO at all, right? They would be like a young woman call, you know, calling you to ask you on a date, and I was like, this is fucking weird. Um, but anyway, you know, it was rad libism, right? It was '90s rad libism that that had this kind of ambient Stalinism, and you know, I I was much more academically educated and. You know, Chris's uh, Trotskyism 
if you will, was really much more of a roadmap to the history of the 20th century, right? It was a much clearer set of, of, of ways of thinking about, which ultimately, you know, I don't think I adopted, or I don't think Chris was trying to get me to adopt. Uh, but, you know, it, it was breaking me of things like Moishe's, like, social theory, is kind of the kind of ahistorical character of, of some of Moishe's thought, his approach to, quote-unquote, traditional Marxism. Um, no, I remember you saying, and this is the typical thing, isn't it, that it's like, well, you know, people aren't going to become Marxists. Like, this revolution is just not going to happen, Right. Like, you're not going to get a majority of people to be Marxists. And I was like, yeah, well, that's not really required. But then, you know, we started talking about things. And it was in the context of not only our teaching, but the war on terror type stuff. And so uh, I think that you got a subscription to Workers Vanguard. And so we would talk about the Spartacists and, um, and, and also our dissatisfaction with the Spartacists. And I even wrote some letters to the workers vanguard like expressing my displeasure at some of their formulations um and so it was a thing you know it was like an object and mm -hmm. uh it was you know i think that that idea that it was a, a kind of a roadmap to the 20th century in a sense it was it was a it was a an estranging mechanism right to get you to sort of look at things consider them um and not naturalize them. So like the new left, especially, but you know, yeah, things like third world. Because we were really at that point engaged in like a highly developed agonistic relationship with Moish and other professors, right? We were really struggling to be uh, intellectuals of our generation, mm. right? And that meant, uh, we had a drunken argument, Spencer. Richard and I had a drunken argument with Adolf and Ken Warren at Jimmy's in Hyde Park about mm. the Iraq invasion. You know, because they were just taking a very standard line, you know, against the war, against the invasion and everything. And and I just said, you know, I was like playing devil's advocate. I was like, but what if the U.S. does establish a liberal democracy in Iraq? However, a neoliberal farcical version of it. And, you know, and they had a hard time sort of answering that. In other words, like, what if this doesn't, you know, I mean, it did become something well, like. They still have a hard time answering that, right? Because they have to, they have to argue that, um, you know, somehow the invasion by the United States created the crisis in the Middle East. Right. Um, right, right. Everything right. was fine. Everything was right. fine until the U.S. knocked over the sandcastles. Mm-hmm. There was a lot, you know, so I, I, I think that, um, you know, another figure that was in the mix uh, was our friend James Vaughn. Hmm. And, you know, a lot of my conversations with Chris were also about you know, a, a deep historical engagement with, you know, with Moish and really the new left's um hostility to bourgeois society and their whole history hmm? to get some background on James James was in the ISO right in uh college at, at Cornell and he was also um a student of uh an acquaintance of Robert Brenner who was not in the ISO but in solidarity and so he he had like what the Spartacists would call the Stalinophobic and the Stalinophilic right? Um, like aspects of Trotskyism in the mm -hmm. background. And, um, and, you know, Robert Brenner, I don't know exactly how he met Robert Brenner, because Robert Brenner was at UCLA, I think at that point. But somehow, you know, they had crossed paths and had maintained contact. And so James also came at this, like, question of, because he also studied, you know, uh, 18th century, right um britain um and so it was very much like yeah what about the marxist view of bourgeois society and the brenner the brenner thesis about the origins of capitalism right uh was something that he was wrestling with and that's about yeah all of that crap like 
the Brenner debate, you know, right. Wallerstein and world systems theory. Right. Like right. Analytical have, Marxism. This is all this is all a heady brew from the late 70s to the 90s. Yeah. Alan Meskins would all of that stuff like political uh, Marxism. Yeah. 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 James and I, you know, processed that we were in um, you know, again, I was in, in the UK doing research and he and I were both working at the British Library together for felt like six months or more. Then every day we would just have coffee together and talk about what we were reading in archives and the books that we were reading that night. And and platypus, the formation of platypus and Marxism and why, you know, the entirety of our education had to be reconsidered. Uh, and the whole, you know, and, and, you know, really it always took the form of like a recovery mm -hmm. of an earlier approach to history um that marxism used to have yeah i mean i i literally the the conclusion of my dissertation derek was basically like it's been all downhill since adam smith on you know on the conquest of india um and you know the the question of of early modern empire um you know it, it was gestures like that that our advisors were just reeling from right mm -hmm. they were like is this Dipesh Chakrabarti. Dipesh Chakrabarti. I mean, a lot of in Europe. Uh, you know, they couldn't recognize what they taught us. You know, and, and what I, we were doing with it. And what we were doing with it. Yeah. But we did, you know, we did have an education and we did use it, but we sort of took it to the next level in a way that, uh, again, really had to do with uncovering the presuppositions and reopening the books that they thought were closed. Hmm. Yeah. Reopening those books. And so it's a funny thing. I mean, I, I know that like, I mean, it's a little strange now because again, there's a total collapse going on. It's like now Gerald Horn and Domenico Lacerdo are going to have the final word, you know, on the Marxist approach to the bourgeois revolution. <laughs> no, I mean, seriously. Right. And uh, uh, the revenge of the uh, the revenge of the Marxist Leninist slash Stalinist, basically. Totally. Like, you know, and I just feel like you want to kill myself, Derek. <laughs> well, but you know, we're we're gonna, we're gonna survive. We're gonna proceed. Uh, you know, we're gonna persevere through, and you know, we'll get the last laugh. I mean, it's it's weird to me though. Even like I've gone through and read a lot of. Uh, early Marxist Leninist text and 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 gone like this is what you're dealing with now uh, is largely unrecognizable because it has a hodgepodge of I mean you, you know if you if you are so unfortunate again on Twitter you incur you you'll encounter things that I am not sure actually exist such as Mecca and MAGA communism post left Marxism oh, it exists. but yeah I've seen I've met some of the Caleb Moffinites. Oh, I unfortunately like, I have too, but <laughs> they definitely exist and they they have they have numbers. They do. There's like that kind of thing. Definitely okay. is out there. But you know, I mean Reed Settlers. Do you remember that? Reed yeah. Settlers? I mean, I remember being in college and thinking that it was gonna be like uh that old Star Trek series, you know, with um Richard Shatner. <laughs> William Shatner, excuse me, William Shatner, where it's the Yangs versus the Combs mm -hmm. on the post-apocalyptic planet. And I was like, yeah, it's going to be the Trotskyists versus the Maoists at the end of the, you know, in the post-apocalyptic wasteland. And um, it's, it does seem like it, you know, from their perspective, it might be true. You know, in other words, if if if, if we're Trotskyists, you know, because it it's, it's a funny thing. I would never have thought in the 90s and in the zeros that we'd come full circle to the 80s and the late 70s, you know, the Jay Sakai, Reed Settlers, you know, and the MIM notes, Maoist International Movement, you know, that, that was distributed um, covertly at Hampshire College, you know, when I was in the Spartacus Youth Club and I was selling Workers Vanguard and MIM notes was sitting there in the library uh, lobby. And I was like, counter-revolution there it is and i'm sure that of course they wrote about how the trotskyists are like you know eurocentric imperialists and we're the counter-revolution you know they were celebrating the shining path 
And the Spartacists were saying that the Shining Path were quasi-fascist, like uh, the um, like the Khmer Rouge. Mm -hmm. And but, you know, you know, I, we've come full circle. I, I, um, you know, I, I I agree with you, Derek, that the the Marxist-Leninism of the past, the 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 Maoism of the past was much better than what we're dealing with now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, right. I'm not a Marxist Leninist fan. I want to make that clear, but it's deep past, it, it, Spencer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the deep past, the 80s version, I'm not sure. The deep past and, you know, obviously like it's its merits were its liabilities. Like it was eclectic and incoherent and mm. you could um you, know, you, you could find, you know, I like for instance the you know the, the the pamphlet that Chris gave me that had the deepest influence on me was or told me to to get from the Spartacist League or something was the Stalinist school of falsification of uh, the critique of Carl, Carl Davidson, um, mm -hmm. left and form right in essence, right? his criticism of Trotskyism from the seventies, right and you know, I don't know, like, I don't know what, and I recommend that to young people from time to time, and they never come back to me. You know, they never say, like, how that made sense or whatever. Like, I, I feel like, like, the, the Maoism today is too unrecognizable and scrambled and indistinguishable from just general rad libism and or general conservatism or whatever. I mean, it seems I mean, the to the mega people, it's an interesting thing. Um, you know, th like uh, infra infrared, right? Mm -hmm. Dude. And I mean, he's like, he's very anti DSA, I suppose, right? He's very like anti social democrat. But, he's, and, um, but they were pro uh, CPUSA, which I've never really understood why you would be. Well. Upset. You know, it's a funny, I mean, Stalinism is a funny thing, but I remember there was a moment, wasn't there a moment when the so-called Red Guards were, like, um, heckling the DSA at various locations, like in Texas and places like that? I think Austin, Texas, the Red Guards showed up to, like, break up break up the social fascist meeting or the social imperialist meeting of the DSA. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, it's on. Yeah, but not really. It didn't last very long. <laughs> Right. It was like a half a second. But I feel like, you know, instead it's mega communism now, you know. Um, and, you know, that's a funny it's 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 whatever it is. Right. I don't see that. Right. But I think intellectually, when we think about what is there to read. Right. And the counter revolution of 1776 and liberalism, a counter history like these things have the unfortunate benefit of being very well distributed books that I'm sure some some fools are teaching in their classroom for Christ's sake. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it, uh, liberalism and counter history actually uh, got into my bloodstream for a little while while I was in Platypus affiliated society, um, and then I sort of struggled through it separately, um, uh, mainly through actually reading other stuff Lasordo wrote and realizing what his background assumptions were and then going back and reading liberalism and counter history and realizing, oh, there are other things hidden in this that I was not informed of. Um, you know, and I mean, ostensibly that book was published by ostensible Trotskyist. I mean, that's the other thing that like it's is first hilarious. Though. It's first so. They're not but, Trotskyists. They're like Trotsky song. <laughs> you know? Well, yeah. I mean, it, Verso is, you know, uh, Verso he hasn't been a Trotskyist in a long time. Right. Verso is is uh, is its own thing, and it's really a corporate I mean, thing now. Perspective, they're Trotskyists. I remember that we went to a historical materialism conference up mm -hmm. in Toronto, and there was a strong South Asian contingent uh probably faculty like academic marxists mm -hmm. who at a certain point just had had enough and they were like enough of this trotskyism like they just sort of got up and yelled like <laughs> you know the trotskyism and i think that it sort of you know sebastian budgen was there and i think that he was a little bit chagrined because he's like but i'm not a trotskyist and they're like you know he didn't say that but you know in other words you are trotskyist and you don't even realize it right because mm -hmm. the background assumptions 
And, you know, of course, they were thumping the table and saying, what about the global south? And there were some Filipino leftists there who were also Maoists, right? And but basically, they did this during our panel, didn't they? Wasn't it like they soon? might have? It might Denise have been. And Atya and I, I think, were speaking, and they thought that they were coming to like to I hear the authentic just... voice of the third world Marxists in in the metropole, together with their you know ally, um, and they were getting something different. And I think they, they might have uh, been they might have been responding to you, but I feel like it was at a certain point in the conference where they had had their fill at the conference. Yeah, you know, it had like reached a point where they were just like enough of this Trotskyism, and but maybe it was you guys who put it over the edge. Maybe it was, and um, and certainly Budgen was like, well, we're not we're not them, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> um, but they also won't publish his uh, Lucerto Stalin book because I don't think they want people to deal with what that says. Like, you know, it's funny, but they should. I mean, after all, they published Osama bin Laden's writings. That's true. Actually, so I don't know why they draw the line at Lacerdo and Stalin. I mean, you know, got to feel for my old country people, like these Italians. <laughs> you know, like Italy, you know, had a pretty traumatic experience after World War II. Um, what is it? The uh, the strategy of stress. What is the or the strategy of what was the um, the preemptive like uh, <laughs> terrorism that the right did in Italy against the left? Mm. Um. Do you know what I'm talking about, Spencer? It's in the cell. The CIA, you know, they had, uh, what was their, they had like a plan in place to like have a coup in Italy if the communists ever oh, like, right. got elected. Right. And, um, but then they had this strategy. Well, they had that in place. Since World 50s. War II. Yeah. Yeah, but they kind of like, you know, really were like. Strategy saying, of tension, right? That's strategy what it was. of tension. Oh. Yeah, not strategy of stress. Strategy of tension. That they were going to like, crack up the communist party by making them lose their nerve so they did like right-wing terrorism like mm. assassinations against the communists and you know like lucerto had to live through that you know so you know and it's so you know no doubt he thought john it must it must all go back to john locke like these cia motherfuckers using the mafia to bomb us here in italy it must it must be in john locke somewhere it's in that second treatise of government, what's happening to us, you know? I mean, it's, uh, it, it is funny to me, though, because if you had asked me in, in 2010 when I was first getting interested in Marxism, I'm like, okay, if there's going to be some kind of Marxist-Leninism, it's going to be like old pre-1978 Maoism. And I was not expecting to encounter... Um, you know, it's hard to. To what extent do you think these young people just think that Trotskyism's the DSA? Mm. Well, there's a lot of that. Yeah, I, yeah. I do think that there's a lot of, because because except for the IMT, although the IMT does do some interest stuff with it, and the Sparts and the Norfites, uh. Everybody else has collapsed into just sub tendencies, little, uh, you know, um, was it caucuses within yeah. the DSA? And interestingly, it has ended tensions between people who had tensions that I never understood anyway. Like I couldn't tell that much of a difference between solidarity and ISO. Um, I know there there was a difference, but um, I mean, the the Shackmanites and the Cliffites had already collapsed into one thing anyway, and they were pushing off to Sarah for Christ's sake. Like, I didn't understand what any of it meant anymore. I mean, Harrington was Shackman's pupil, mm -hmm. you know, totally. And so you could just say the DSA is Shackmanite social democrat, like Cold War social democrats, and just, you know, have done with it like that. I mean, obviously, um, Harrington opposed Reaganism in the 80s. So he had his kind of leftist bona fides, you know, he did the whole, you know, he had no problem supporting the Stalinists in Central America or South Africa. You know, he wasn't a Stalinophobe like that. Right. So, but I do think that um, these are the ways that people's discontent with the state of the left is going to be expressed. Yeah. And yeah. it's going to be, it's going to be sort of, it's just, it's just going to assume a lot. It's going to assume like history has led us to this point and not reconsider like 
the deep background, not reconsider the history, but just accept it as this is the outcome. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, one thing I can say uh, as a person who ha flirted with the late sectarian left, and I'm really from it. I came from a, before I got into platypus, I came from uh, SPUSA. A J, um, I was in a, I wasn't even a full member because by half the time I was in the country. Um, and I was associated with the, what was it? The radicals tendency or something, which was a weird, like now I know to be kind of Marcyite. Um, but I didn't know that at the time, like Kasama slash Trotskyist hybrid group. Um, and they kind of got their asses kicked, uh, against, I believe the McNally more social democratic faction. Um, Mac Reynolds, what was his Mac name? Reynolds, Mac Reynolds, not McNally. Yeah, McNally's a Marxologist, right? Yeah, Mac Reynolds, um, kind of faction, uh, leading between 2008 and 2012. And I started talking to you guys in 2011, and then Occupy happened, and I was like, you know what, I'm not gonna mess with this SPUSA stuff because it's clearly Occupy had some paleocons too. Yeah, there were paleocons in the anti war movement. There were paleocons in the Occupy movement. No, there definitely was. Yeah. Um, and so there's all kinds of weird shit in the Occupy movement. I mean, that... You know, but that <laughs> might be a virtue of it. Right. In other words, I think that, um, you know, a, a kind of... I do think that there were only a couple of authentic upsurges of leftism in our time, in mm. the time that Spencer and I have been friends, in the time of Platypus, and it would be the anti-war movement in Occupy. You know, I really don't think that the Sanders moment and the DSA moment was that, because I think that um, what had been prepared by Boscar and others was to, you know, who came out of that experience, came out of the anti-war movement, came out of Occupy, but they sort of prepared this funnel to channel it into Sandersism and DSA, even though, you know, they had a whole way of thinking that was prior to that, right? Prior to the Sanders moment. Um, and so, but they didn't give the younger people the benefit of understanding that, right? Um, and so I do think that, you know, the fact that there was all sorts of people coming out of the woodwork, discontented with the war on terror, discontented with the Great Recession, discontented with Obamaism, um, I think spoke well of it. I mean, you know, of course we went to Occupy too. They had Occupy it Chicago. It just and felt like, to, you know, to me, it just, it, it's felt like since 2015, 2016, there's a great narrowing on the left. Um, you know, this, you know, this, this horrific world that we're experiencing now, right? This deep authoritarianism on the left and, or what passes as the left. Like it was just foreseeable. Like you just knew, right? Okay, this is where this is gonna go, right? It's like as soon as the Sanders movement took off and the left started glomming onto it, um, you you could feel the intellectual oxygen oh, and yeah. kind of energy just being sucked out. And a lot more you know, it, 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 it conversations felt much more like some kind of psychological uh, contest, like you were appealing to to people to think or to not be afraid or to think outside of the, you know, confines that they were uh, imposing upon themselves. It, 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 Trump, of course, did that. Right. Yeah, obviously Trump consolidated all of that. Trump really did that. And um, that's that's the part that, you know, rallied me to my second controversial existence or something. Because I think the first controversial existence was that we were in the context of the anti-war movement willing to entertain a broad left perspective on the questions raised by the war. And, you know, just willing to say, look, you, these are not settled matters, you know, someone like Paul Berman, who we didn't agree with, 
or Christopher Hitchens, for that matter, who we didn't agree with, were still raising points that you had to deal with. You had to deal with. You can't, like, pretend these don't exist. And, uh, again, Occupy was a little bit different. Like, it wasn't polarizing in the same way. Um, but the Trump moment, I just knew, okay, Trump's going to be the big excuse to not think. And in, in our in, in our entire youth, right, Reagan was the bugbear. Reagan was the excuse not to think back then. Right. And you could just see it happening again. It was happening again. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Adolf was good back then, for example. Like, he refused to stop thinking. Even though he gave up the socialist project to fight Reaganism, he still refused to stop thinking through that period. Um, you know, I, I mentioned my old professor, Margaret Cirillo. The Jesse Jackson phenomenon. Jesse Jackson phenomenon, yeah, I read that. and it was, It's a brilliant you know, book. It's quite brilliant. And um, But I remember at Hampshire the Clarence Thomas hearings, the Anita Hill versus Clarence Thomas hearings, the Marxist professors were enthralled. They were enthralled by this. Like they were totally like team Anita Hill, you know, mm -hmm. like contra Clarence Thomas. And, you know, and it was out of that anti-Reaganism because that came fairly late in the game in the Reagan era. You know, it's I think that was under, was he nominated by Reagan or by Bush, by Herbert Walker Bush? It's pretty late in the game, isn't it? George Herbert Walker Bush. Yeah, it's, it's Herbert Walker Bush. And so, you know, I just thought, wow, you know, because I, I kind of didn't think much of it, really, to tell the truth. And I was like, oh, this is what they care about. And then when when bill clinton was elected you know they spent uh the whole year before he was elected complaining about how he was attacking black people by going back to arkansas and like executing you know a learning disabled black man and by condemning sister soldier right but then when he was elected they were ecstatic they were ecstatic my marxist professors derek oh. Do you think that this, that your podcast and audience has really grown in that context of being like a kind of, I don't know what, um, how you would describe your relationship to like the DSA and the Sanders left, but is it a... The Trump era. Is, is it a Trump era phenomena? I think my particular brand is actually sort of a post-Trump era phenomena, but I do think that the reason why I exist is as a kind of counter- so like 2020 thing. Yeah, it's a kind of a counter response to that because I started saying like, look, like, actually, I'm surprised this has not been thrown at me because when I was in, I was in Egypt and people, you know, so I was not in the United States at the time, but I said during the Trump the Trump election. I was like, he can win. Um, it's not as far fetched as you think. And what you guys are afraid of, I don't think is possible under our current regime. And I think he's going to be a lot more like George Bush and um, Trump. Trump. Yeah. A and I, and even Doug Lane back then was like, he thought I was crazy. Like, um, and I was just like, I just, you guys are like positing that he's going to pull out some dark magic right wing Keynesianism and like, and like, you know, all these paleo conservatives are going to radically alter the military. And I just don't believe that's going to happen. Um, if the military alters, it's because its generals have decided, regardless of whether or not the, it's being framed in, in Pat Buchanan world or in, um, uh, what you know, uh, John Rumsfeld world, how that that the that their imperial limits have kind of just reached a nadir that they can't push any further. They're gonna and I started talking about Hadrian's walling it. So you know, I was a counter voice. I also uh, Wait, Obama promised that too. Let's yeah, I know. Care. Trump I know. Trump basically um, promised to deliver where Obama had not. Right. Especially on the war. 
on the war on terror, but also on other things like immigration reform. Let's not forget that George W. Bush and Obama had both promised immigration reform, and that's all Trump wanted to achieve. And the wall was just a, um, a tactic in, in that negotiation rather than, you know, but, the, you know, Derek, you know, you're old enough, but certainly Spencer and I are old enough to know that every Republican president is called a fascist. Yeah, I am. Like, right. And so just to see through that. Right. But, you know, but but Trump was such a kind of out of left field, so to speak, um, that I don't know, this time it's plausible. I mean, Spencer, didn't you meet George W. It's Bush? amazing. Also, you know, every Republican is a fascist and every Democrat is a disappointment. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It's like, it's how can you, you know, how many yeah. times can you see this repeated? Yeah, it's an amazing, it's amazing. Well, the only one who's not a disappointment is the one who got assassinated, JFK. Right. Right. But and he was a disappointment up to the point where he was assassinated. He was a disappointment. <laughs> but then he got off the hook for that one. But Spencer, didn't you meet George W. Bush when he was a young man? Yeah, he, he came to, I mean, it wasn't that long before he ran for president. He he, he came to my... But he wasn't governor of Texas. I think he... I think he Maybe he, I think maybe not. He I was living in Washington. Yeah, he wanted to. It was before he got dry. Yeah, he was he was he was definitely drunk, and he wanted to talk to my cousin. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think that you described it as showed up drunk at her doorstep, and so that was before before the evangelism, before the going sober, right? Yep. All right. One of the things that has that has been just like also kind of shocking to me um, mm. as a person who still feels like that the George W. Bush regime was actually more brutal than the Trump regime in a, oh. a whole yeah. ton of ways. I mean, <laughs> um, well, the war on terror, the war on terror, let's truth be told, the war, war on terror was worse than Vietnam. Right. I mean, it, it's more damaging. It's it's. Domestically it, and in the world, like in the Middle East, like, yeah. Um, and Vietnam was bad, of course, but but the war on terror, in many respects, was more destructive. I mean, absolutely. And I have, and the, and the dem, I mean, the Democrats under George W. Bush were just. Awful, right? Yes. I mean, they they could not be outflanked on the right, right? Swift it's hard. Boating. Hmm? Swift boating, Swift boating. Yeah. John Kerry. Did John Kerry deserve his Purple Heart? Right. And Hillary the Clinton like, like, definitely like, deserved his Purple Heart. <laughs> <laughs> like getting like the unions to stop like a bunch of Gulf countries from buying up like certain dockyards right and like wrapping themselves in the flag i mean there was it was awful right just straight up xenophobia um but meanwhile in the background a whole generation you know of millennials went through the military experience and came out very anti-war but totally independently of the left right and also i mean that's that's one of the things is like Whatever we mean by this voting term. for Trump in 2016, right? Overwhelming numbers. Yeah. Right. Well, whatever we mean by this term, but I even know like old Christians who now talk about American Empire and the problems with it. So it's it is no longer that is no longer like a weird dissident thing. But it's just it's also the recapitulation. I, I work with some fairly conservative people. I also work with a bunch of like you know Biden liberals. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a guy get weepy about George Bush. And I'm just like, he's like, you know, when the conservatives were so much, but I'm like, I'm disgusted. <laughs> just, um, it, 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 it seems to just be, I don't know. I mean, we're always on the next thing in capital right. politics, right? Right. It's just, you move on. We pretend that like none of this ever happened. Uh, we don't deal with the fact. I mean, you guys were actually. I will give you credit for this. Now that that Brenner's thrown around, um, and I'm gonna have to end after this point. But uh, now that Brenner's throwing around stuff like political capitalism, and there's been all these people talking about techno neo feudalism, a concept that like 
kind of drives me up the wall. But um, Jody Dean and Yanis Varoufakis. Yep. They're going techno feudalism. It's like, yeah, <laughs> another yeah. excuse. Right. It's, um, but I'm also sitting here just thinking like, okay, we, we keep on coming up with excuses. We, we've turned back to the current, we've und, I di- one of the reasons I left Platypus was that I didn't believe in regression. Mm. Mm. Um, do you believe in it now? I do. <laughs> I, do. I can't. I like. I. 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 I'm. I'm trying. To, I'm still trying to come up with my exact mm. framework for why I believe it. But I'm just like I've just seen all these tendencies just, just go long backwards. Enough. Like, long enough, and uh, suddenly the regression thesis will make sense. It's like it's just like, why are we pulling from? I mean, there's this wild period immediately after Occupy fail where people are like going to stuff like Georgism. But then I'm like, wait, I'm literally watching us roll back to the beginning of the new left. Like, and then, but then also simultaneously to it's like farce dregs in the eighties. Yeah. Like at simultaneously. Yeah. And well, it's, it's, just, it's the rank and file strategy. It's the, you know, the, the, the hysterical reaction to Reagan, right? All of like, they're not going to, they're not going to miss a single box. Yeah. The right. rank and file strategy, right. ironically, ironically has, <laughs> but, but you know, because I work a lot in trade union stuff, and uh-huh. um, the rank and file strategy to me has actually created a whole lot of staffers who've done the exact same thing that that like led to unions becoming unpopular in the seventies and eighties, and when you when you point that at people, they're like, well, oh, well, that was just ideology, and I'm like, no, it's structural. It was structural, and you re and you yeah. recapitulated it without realizing you recapitulated it almost step for step, because it's objectively conditioned and also politically conditioned. It's not objectively conditioned in terms of like just economics. It's politically conditioned in terms of, uh, like the way American politics is organized. It's I always like to point out, as far as the union movement is concerned, if it's a movement, it's not really um, that the unions are much more safely in the pocket of the Democrats in the era of neoliberalism than they were before. Yeah. Yeah. Right. In other words, when you think of like the Fordist kind of new deal coalition, the unions were there, but they also were willing to endorse Republicans when it suited them precisely to punish the Democrats. Um, And since then in their, in their period of decline, Right, they've lost any independence from the Democratic Party. And the right and file strategy, as interpreted through Jay McEvery, uh, and has interpreted through the DSA's reading of Jay McEvery, has led to a focus on we have to get progressive wins through the Democrats, through people entering staffing and encouraging rank and file it's very staffing. It's very 80s. What I experienced here in Chicago, this is before I knew Spencer. It was during the time of Adolf Reed's Labor Party activity. Um, the Teamsters for a Democratic Union, uh, who were all Maoists, Freedom Road Socialist Organization, and um, you know, and still are, right? And so they were the people who proletarianized, who you know, marched through the institutions, including the unions, mm-hmm. right? The long march through the, inst- through the institutions was also the unions, and um, you know, they. They are the basis for, yeah, the progressive wing of, or the labor wing, however you want to talk about it, of the Democratic Party. And uh, and the DSA is doing that. Of course they are. Yeah, they're doing just exactly the same thing. And in that context, they're not really taking their tutelage from like a Harringtonian DSA perspective, but from the existing labor bureaucracy that the new left gave us. And on that depressing note, we'll have to... I was um, just going to add, if I could, that... I don't know how to put it. Like, There's a way in which, like, being Gen X, like, you didn't have, like, a strong sense of your own generation. Right. And your own identity. Right. Um, And in that, you know, you certainly didn't have a sense of, like, insisting on your novelty. Or, Or on our own experience. Yeah. Right. 
and I think that in a certain way that attuned uh, me certainly to thinking about repetition and regression, right? That, you know, one of the things that is, you know, both fascinating and I think a curse about the millennials is their sense of generational identity. Um, you know, that I, I think in the end, um, you know, resulted in them being like a farcical repetition yeah. of the past and having no identity at all. Um, and that's, you know, to go back to this question of like proto platypus and what, you know, our friendship was about and what, you know, generation zero of platypus was about. Yeah, it really was about the kind of interruption of a repetition regression pattern, right? The attempt to do that at a pedagogical level. Um, All bets are off. Yeah. We don't have to accept any of the uh, wagers of the past. And I think that, you know, it's that kind of question that maybe you and in your audience, um, you know, certainly uh, that, that we're, you know, it's it's funny now to see the Zoomers who sort of stand structurally in the position a lot like Gen X. In the shadow of the millennials. In the shadow of the millennials. Um, the way we is, were in the shadow of the boomers. Yeah, so, you know, rather than just like, I, I guess it's, you know, it, it, you said before we went on the air, you know, that the kids are not all right, Derek. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I think it's really about thinking, you know, how to educate a kind of overshadowed generation now, right? In, in, in thinking about the long-term point of any such education. Yeah, that's actually... Uh, a whole lot of this return to Marxism has has uh, returned to Marxism has has seemed to me to be somewhat pointless. <laughs> um, uh, not, and it's because it, it it has recapitulated so many of of the mistakes of the past in a way that like also has tried to erase stuff that's even in my living memory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, it's one thing that like, oh yeah, we're, we're a hundred some odd years off from the Bolsheviks. Like, um, I got it. I understand that. But when you're talking about like, we're not even being completely honest about like what American life was like pre nine 11 and, even a fair amount of millennials remember that. Um, you know, I know everyone in my generation basically, like, we were 20 when all this shit started. Um, so it's, 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 it is important to kind of reground what all this is for, um, particularly because there are other tendencies that we'll have to talk about another time of like both blatant opportunism but also utter apocalypticism that like weirdly reinforce each other and yet they produce nothing like like the the one thing i can say honestly to to all of to all of my dsa friends is like on every single thing you said you cared about at the beginning of the sanders in 2015 2016 you have failed and i have not heard a good accounting from any of you as to why and what that means other than like Oh, the PMC, or oh, I'm like, okay, fine, but most of you are the PMC, if that's even a valid category. So that's not really explanatory. Um, and, and at least if you're not pointing that also at yourself, um, you know, et, et, et cetera. Um, you know, conditions, I'm like, well, conditions are always bad. Uh, the really dumb ones, it's federal government. <sighs> do, what do you think Marx has dealt with in the 19th and early 20th century? I mean, like, come on. Um, most of you guys aren't getting executed. I'm just pointing that out. So it's, 
it, it is that element of it is just maddening in some ways to me. And I've become a lot more, <laughs> I've sort of like come not, you know, not completely around, but I, I've come to the point where like, I understand now going back to where I was in 2011, why coming out of Occupy Yoido, I went and w got, was looking up stuff, found Kasama Project, found it kind of weird, found you guys' engagement with Kasama Project, read your back engagements, and then literally emailed, I believe, Pam Nagalis and was like, look, I, if can you put me in touch with somebody to go through the reading group? Like, I'm in South Korea. I know that's going to be kind of a stretch, but mm -hmm. let's see. Mm -hmm. um, like, I get it now in a way that I've kind of forgotten since then, but... I have also been quite wrong. I I did not think that the 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 Boshkar Sankara uh, strategy was going to work. I didn't see neo Kautskyism coming out of nowhere, um, and yet it also seems to function as like kind of a less clear Trotskyism. Um, mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's it and and then like I, I'm you know. My this has got to be another conversation, but I now have talked to Matt Cavagrodi on this. Uh, I have seen what, quote, left and Marxist economics has also become. And that was one of my initial critiques of my experience. Like, oh, it didn't help me understand. But now that I've looked at what the economics that most of most of the left has produced, it hasn't been helpful. Like it, it's either explanatory but not not predictive or it's not it, it's just frankly you know blah 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 we can print money also the dollar's gonna collapse tomorrow meh you know like and that that's been like a consistent prediction for like three or four years um and so you know the frustrations are definitely there or it's like running back to the odds like can we find this magic zizek moment again where we all like kind of got through our dependence on all these Derrida and, and postmodernism. And I'm like, in the po uh, to some degree, yeah, and Foucault and Deleuze, oh my God, are still around. But um, to, an, to a different degree, that's already been won. It's, a, it's an old battle. Um, it's an academic battle too, but it's an old, it, it is an old battle that, that is not particularly... It's also a false victory. Right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, well I, I'll let you end on that uh, on that point because I do have to go do another do have another engagement. But but what is a false victory there? I because I, I think I agree with you, but I want to hear what you have to say. Well, I, I'm just mean that you know the the kind of you know materialism return of the real. Yeah, you know resolution or overcoming of postmodernism. Mm -hmm. Right. It. It, it leaves all of the the thought taboos in, yeah. in place. And, you know, I, I think, I mean, I, I'm to the point where I, I mean, I'm astounded when I talk to some of these people, some of these Lacanian, Zizekian characters, it just sort of how little contact they have with, um, with the history of Marxism, with, right with Marx himself, right. with, uh, you know, what they call Hegel and what I would recognize is that it just, you know, it, it really isn't, you know, the only good thing about it is, you know, that you could, maybe if you, maybe if Zizek or something was like, you stepped off of the, you know, of, of, of the runaway train, you know, it was like some kind of exit ramp. Um, you know, but it, it doesn't really get, you know, it, it, it doesn't really break with the object that it's criticism. It's completely bound up by it, you know, and it's a more obscure sort of Althusserian, Heideggerian, Lacanian confusion than I think was there before. You know, Chris would have more to say on that. It leaves a lot I, of the postmodern issues kind of unaddressed too, right? In other words, um, <clears throat> it's you know, they're kind of lurking in the background, you know, waiting to come back. Um, and so, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a curious thing. It is, you know, I almost, I almost have a kind of, uh, 
nostalgia for a kind of like, I don't know, Frankfurt School versus postmodernism kind of Moish approach, you know, mm -hmm. where Moish would be like, you know, uh, actually, you know, the postmodernists, you know, like Foucault was reading the Frankfurt School, but did he really answer them? Or did he kind of dodge it, you know? And mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I don't know about I, I don't know about the future of postmodernism in academia, but also in the general culture. I mean, Derek, you probably know this from like, you know, K through 12 education, right? A lot of people who might have become higher education academics are forced to become high school teachers. Absolutely. What, what they do is they they subject <laughs> high school students to Foucault. Right, because I get them as college students, which is which is truly like, a, a crime. Read, it's truly child abuse. I it mean. Is, it truly is. I'm like, I'm like, wait, you've read Foucault already? When was that? You know, these college kids. Oh, in high school, and I'm like, oh no. Right. <laughs> I mean, the advantage being that one only takes what one learns in high school so seriously, anyway. True. Right. <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah. Well, thank you too. We're definitely going to have maybe uh, another another part two where we talk about how Platypus understands Marxism and the different Marxisms. Um, uh, and so cool. we will come back to that. Have a great evening, you two. Thanks a lot, Derek. Thanks, thank Derek. You. That was fun. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.